Hey guys, this is the third and final video for subtopic 1.1, Properties and Uses of Materials. As you can see, this is the uh, key idea in intended student learning for today. And to just summarize this, our learning objective is to understand how the properties of substances in a mixture can actually be used to separate them. So our focus is going to talk about mixtures and I'll give you some introduction to the different types and then we'll talk about how we can actually separate different types of mixtures. Mixtures are everywhere around us and essentially most materials that we actually are exposed to are made up of a combination of different substances. And these substances aren't chemically combined together, which is what a mixture is. If we chemically combine substances together, that actually creates a new substance. So we're not looking at that today. Mixtures can have a range of different compositions or different makeups. And it's really the composition that helps dictate how we actually separate those particular mixtures. So to start off, I'm going to talk about a few different general types of mixtures. The first one is what we call a homogeneous mixture. And it's a mixture that has a uniform consistency throughout. The word homogeneous stems from two parts. So the first part is homo, which means the same and genus, which refers to the phase or the state of it. The key thing is, in an homogeneous mixture, you can't actually distinguish between the different components. So this is an example of an homogeneous mixture here. The opposite of this is what we call a heterogeneous mixture. So hetero actually means different or opposite, and then the genus means phase or state. So this has a non-uniform consistency. It means that we can actually distinguish between the different components quite readily. And it also makes it quite easy for us to separate those different components because each of those components will ha actually retain their individual characteristics quite well. We've got an image of some colored M&Ms here. So this is trying to represent a heterogeneous mixture. And we could easily just separate the different colored M&Ms from one another. Going back to uh, mixtures and homogeneous mixtures in particular, we can form an homogeneous mixture by adding a soluble salt, like copper sulfate, into a good solvent like water. And as we mix them together, we can form what we call copper sulfate solution. And the particular terms we use here, we've got the solute, as we've learnt before, it's the substance that gets dissolved and present in a lesser amount. It gets dissolved by our solvent, in this case water, and our mixture itself is called a solution. Air is another example of an homogeneous mixture. Um, so it's made up of a combination of various gases, so 78% nitrogen, You've got about 21% oxygen, and then the remaining 1% made up of gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a few other trace uh, gases. We know that uh, two substances that don't mix quite well are water and oil. And so normally they will form a heterogeneous mixture quite readily, but we can actually add substances called emulsifiers to help the two mix with one another. So in this case, the oil droplets can easily disperse throughout the uh, water, which is the solvent in this case, and form what we call an emulsion. Other types of mixtures that we might find, are things like muddy water. So in this case, this would also be heterogeneous because if you leave some muddy water to settle over time, we would see that most, if not all, of the soil and the clay particles will settle by gravity and they'll settle at the bottom and leave a liquid that would look you know, clear, hopefully colourless, um, but not in all cases. So you still might have certain components suspended throughout, but generally speaking, muddy water would be a heterogeneous mixture. 
This is an example of what we call an aerosol. So this is where you have a gas that is mixed in a liquid. And so we can see we've got a fizzy drink here. And often when we open up a bottle of fizzy drink, we'd see that the bubbles that are contained or dissolved start to rise to the top. And that's because the gas particles will be less dense. And so they'll rise through the liquid and then escape as a gas. Uh, one final mixture is uh, what we got here. So a mixture of a solid in a gas, and this is what we term a uh, smoke. This slide, it uh, summarizes some of the key components of mixtures and their characteristics. So make sure you spend some time and study the different characteristics. So looking at composition, whether the components are joined or not, properties, the separation techniques and some examples. On the side here, we've got information about compounds and we'll talk more about this in later topics. So just make sure you can refer back to this because often mixtures and compounds can be confused um, with one another. Now going into how we separate mixtures, we're gonna focus on four key techniques that uh, we can use to separate mixtures. We'll start off with the first one, which is filtration. So just imagine that we had, uh, for example, sandy water. We know that sand doesn't dissolve in water. So if we want to separate the two uh, very, very well, then we can use a filtration setup. What we've got here is a filtration apparatus. We've got uh, a filter funnel here. We've got filter paper that's been folded into the filter funnel. And this will act to trap any large particles from getting through, but it will allow small enough particles like water molecules to pass through our funnel and then be collected in our conical flask here. Just a few key terms with this. The liquid that passes through the filter, is called the filtrate, and then the solid that ends up remaining on our filter paper is called the residue. These uh, next series of images just show you in three steps how this filtration place, um, how this filtration technique takes place. So again, we've got our solid and liquid mixture. We've got our filtration apparatus. We pour our mixture in, and it's going to separate the solid from the liquid. And eventually, we can completely separate the two, and the liquid water will eventually filter all the way through into our beaker in this case. The second is a technique that uh, we need to use when you have a solid that actually dissolves in a liquid. So what we've got here is a solution and it could be something like salty water. Now filtration won't separate the salt from the water. So what we're going to do in this case is carry out evaporation. So this will involve heating a sample of your solution and what will happen is that as we heat our solution, the water which has the lower melting and boiling point will actually start to boil off and it will turn into a vapor. And this will take place much more readily than our salt. So if we leave this over time, we'd notice that the water level will start to drop as it's being converted from a liquid to a gas and you'll start to see the formation of our salt crystals on the bottom here. And if we continue this process, we completely evaporate the water and we're just left with a crystallized solute, which is our salt crystals. The problem with this is that the water essentially gets lost and so we can't actually kind of recuperate that. If we did want to, however, we can carry out a, another separation technique which is called distillation. This is a technique that we also use to separate liquids from one another based on their boiling points. But let's just look at this one for now. So we've got our salty water in this uh, round bottom flask here, but the key difference is that we've stopped at the top to prevent the vapors from escaping. We've got this little outlet here, which is connected to a piece of glassware called a condenser. And the job of the condenser is to effectively condense the liquid, uh, sorry, to condense the vapors back into a liquid so that eventually they will travel 
through the condenser and then into another uh, receiving vessel, so perhaps in another beaker. The condenser itself, uh, I call it a tube within a tube because around the outside, the outside tube allows for water to flow around this inner tube, which is connected to the round bottom flask. So the vapors travel up here. They will get to this section here where the water is flowing around and it's helping cool those vapors into a liquid so that um, eventually by gravity, they'll be collected into this beaker here. And if we carry this out over time, you could effectively remove and completely separate the salt from the water, but still keep both of those components without losing any of them. The last technique involves often separating um, components of mixtures that can be pigments or dyes from one another. So we might have some different uh, inks or plant dyes which could be made up of uh, a range of different components. At the moment we can see that there are three different components that are spotted on this sheet here. So this is commonly known as chromatography paper and we can actually use something like filter paper as well. What we're going to do is dip it into a solvent and the solvent, what it will do is it'll rise through, it'll travel through the chromatography paper by a process called capillary action. And as it does that, it will help carry some of those components of your mixtures as well, but it will do so to varying degrees. And a lot of this has to uh, do with the properties of those materials and how well they actually become attracted to the solvent as well as how well they are attracted to what we call your stationary phase, uh, which in this case is your chromatography paper. So if we let the solvent travel up the paper, not quite to the top, but very close, and we'll mark a line here which is called the solvent front. So we don't want it to travel all the way up, otherwise the components will also travel all the way up, and it will mean that the components won't then be separated. So if we do that, we can actually start to see that some of these inks or dyes are actually made up of a combination of different components, whereas some of them may actually not be. And so we can then compare different inks or different dyes from one another. And this can actually be used uh, in forensic science to confirm the presence of different paints or pigments at crime scenes. So that basically concludes uh, this first subtopic on uh, properties and uses of materials. Uh, the next video that we'll go into will look at atomic theory and uh, looking at some of the fundamental ideas about atoms and how it will link into these ideas.